there was <coughs> there's a certain uh, special interest in Milton in view of the present conditions of not only our own country but the world. John Milton, who was born in 1608, was not only a classical poet but a perfect nuisance as a politician. <laughs> this was an interesting combination of values. He has been remembered as one of the greatest pamphleteers who ever annoyed government. And he succeeded so well that the country really never got over his annoyances entirely. He was a person who, I guess we would say, was star-driven. From his earliest life, it seemed as though he had been selected for a special destiny. Highly gifted, of uncertain disposition, but of tremendous intensity of dedication. He has been remembered as one of the most important literary figures in the history of Europe. This uh, circumstance began in childhood. Milton was a poet at 15, with considerable ability and a great penetration of spirit. He attended Cambridge, and from the day he got there to the day he left, he was troublesome. In fact, he was a, a, a requested to resign at one time. He left, but he came back, and remained altogether nearly seven years in higher education, which he detested. But he was sacrificing his personal feelings for a certain amount of important information. He was quite certain that the universities were educationally delinquent. They did not teach what human beings needed to know. You could graduate from the best of them in those days with very little positive accomplishment except an increasing capacity to handle local beer. This was the main record of the universities for many years, the amount of liquor that they used. The educational side seemed to have been completely overlooked. Not only were these schools famous and infamous, but they were unhealthy. The atmosphere was moldy and wet and damp. The stone walls dripped. Most of the apartments and classrooms were dark and ill-ventilated. But those were the punishments that went with higher learning in those days. It is from the university, however, at Cambridge, uh, that Milton gained his familiarity with languages. He did not learn very much about any important scholastic subject, but he learned to use the classical languages and several of the European languages with proficiency. He also has the principal distinction, however, of being one of the few of his time in his level of thinking who chose to write in English. Now this in itself is an interesting phenomenon because uh, 15 or 20 years before the beginning of the 17th century, English was practically an impossible dialect. It was useless. It was very little better than the pure Chaucerian, which nobody could understand. Almost all of English at that time was local. There was idiom that uh, dominated provinces. And when a group of soldiers had to train, being recruited from the various provinces, the orders of the day had to be given in several different languages, dialects and idioms, because otherwise nobody understood them. Yet 25 years after that, we have one of the greatest uh, examples of English literature ever done, and that is the King James Bible, a masterpiece resulting from a tremendous upheaval in thinking and in style and in education that occurred in these few years. So Milton started out to gain a classical education and at the same time to discover the inadequacy of the basic educational policies of his time. 
Realizing, however, that it was important for him to have certain contacts, he finally went back to Cambridge and stayed there for seven years. And during this time, he wrote considerably in poetry, some prose. But he was mostly learning to use the tools of his craft. He had a magnificent vocabulary. He had a marvelous daring in his usage of words. And he was most of all tremendously dedicated on a religious level. Uh, Milton belonged to what might be termed in these days a dissenting clergy. Uh, he was definitely part of the, we might say, puritanical motion in England. He was Protestant in every sense of the word and spent much of his time doing what the Protestants got their name from, protesting. He was very much of the opinion that the government of England was in very poor condition. And he had hardly graduated from Cambridge before the problems of the civil situation in the country became important to him. He uh, realized that uh, with King James uh, I departed, James was a kind of a, not a very dangerous man. He was a kind of a simple character who was able to accomplish a fairly long rulership without causing any very great excitement. And along the way, he supported and uh, improved the condition of many scholars, including Bacon. But with his passing came Charles I, who was unhappy, unfortunate, and disliked from the beginning. Charles seemed to feel that the people existed to improve the financial condition of the rich. We have heard of such things more recently. <laughs> he was convinced that taxation was simply moving that which was necessary to the people to, to provide the luxuries of the idle. The aristocracy in his day was an aristocracy of birth, but it took advantage of its aristocracy to pillage the public. Charles was a spendthrift. He was completely indifferent to the needs of the people. He never listened to anybody. He did exactly as he pleased and favored his own clique to the very ultimate. As this condition continued and became increasingly worse, there was undoubtedly time for a revolutionary change. And in this particular situation, uh, Milton found his mark. He became the spokesman of the underprivileged. He uh, became, what might be said, rather hated by the upper group but the group up there had practically no influence in controlling the actions of the public. The public was with Milton. And as a result of that, uh, he was comparatively safe. In the height of this situation, there loomed upon the horizon Oliver Cromwell, who became Lord Protector of England. And the first thing he did when he gained authority was to ex execute the king. That was the end of Charles I. Now, Cromwell was a man of iron character and also a man of tremendous personal ambitions. Cromwell was as hard as nails. He was an old soldier in manner and quality. He was a strict, square-toed Puritan in almost every way. But, of course, he had his own ideas about how a country should be run. And in spite of every effort to uh, bring the country into a better condition, Cromwell was concerned primarily with maintaining his own position, which was not easy, because England up to that time had been for nearly 1,500 years a monarchy. In the course of time, uh, Cromwell's influence began to wane. He became more and more dictatorial. He determined to have his own way at all costs. He created his own cronies. He developed his own proselyting propensities. And gradually the public mind turned against him. 
He was, however, successful in holding his position to the time of his death. He was succeeded by his son, who lasted just one year. He did not have his father's strength, ambitions, and dramatic ability. The public, in the meantime, very much disappointed and unhappy over everything. They had gotten rid of one nuisance and gotten another in its place decided that the great experiment of democracy in England was a failure. So they called Charles II to the throne, and he arrived in the midst of this tremendous conflict between the royalists and the republicans, or what might be termed the conservatives and the progressives. Charles started out with almost everything against him. He, but he was a more prudent man. It occurred to him that one of the secrets of success, as he regarded the career of Charles I, thoughtfully, was to win the approval of the people. He might have his peculiar foibles, but he had to also represent them to some degree. He had to do something for them, and was fortunate enough to realize this fact. He was a scholar, much more so than uh, his predecessors, and among his first public acts was to establish the Royal Society of London, which became the basis of scientific advancement in England for nearly 200 years, and included such men as Newton and uh, other progressives in its uh, list of members. The Royal Society was a success. It was built on the basis of Bacon's contributions to learning and dedicated to him. But Charles kindly, gradually, Charles II, gained control of the situation. He was in very difficult times at first, but after a while, the English people settled back and accepted him, and he became comparatively popular. Now, what all this has to do with Milton is, is maybe not obvious at first, but remember that Milton was campaigning for Cromwell. Now, when Cromwell party lost, the, car, the uh, Lord Protector ceased to be important, and the Royalists returned in Charles II, uh, Milton found himself in extremely difficult situations. He was picked out as being one of the rabble-rousers of the Commonwealth. He was prosecuted and persecuted. In fact, he was temporarily imprisoned. He was on the wrong side of the political situation. And this caused him a great deal of trouble. His pamphlets were publicly burned, and uh, as far as his political career was concerned, uh, Milton was finished. But this had very little effect upon his literary advancements. Actually, he was a poet of outstanding abilities, and in spite of the difficulties politically, he was finally given a chair at Oxford and was at that time also able to attain uh, a considerable scholastic reputation. He had also, in the meantime, managed to get his master's at Cambridge. So as education went, he was in a comparatively secure position, but his popularity rose and fell every day. And in the midst of this, the great problem of his life set in. His eyesight failed. As a result of that, he, rem he remembered back to the time when he first began to see these lighting light flashes in his eyes. Little by little, his sight became poorer. He had given practically his entire eyesight uh, to research and study. He was an avid reader, a good scholar, and a good thinker but his eyes had been not strong from early life. And by uh, the time that he was through with his political career, uh, John Milton was blind. He was completely blind. This, however, seems to have had very little effect upon his career. Having been finally liberated from political involvements, he settled down to the great work of his life, and that was the writing of his heroic poem, on the uh, biblical subject, Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained. Paradise Lost was practically a summary of the opening chapters of Genesis. Uh, 
It was based entirely upon the Protestant interpretation of the early parts of the Old Testament. There were certain additions, however, that arose from Milton's basic scholarship. He was well aware of the ancient legends of the Jewish people. He was conversant with Greek and Roman antiquities, theology, and theogony. He was more or less aware of the contemporary thinking of scholars uh, of his own time, and when he visited Rome, he met and discussed his problems with another blind man, Galileo. So he moved in a good intellectual circle, but now in his older years, he turned his attention directly to the cultivation of a great religious epic that he hoped would have lasting effect upon human society. Actually, at this time also, he had a family in which, uh, they, again, tragedies were numerous. His first wife died, leaving him with three children. His second wife, whom he adored, died in childbirth. And all through his life, his conditions were uncertain. He was, however, uh, fairly well cared for by a third wife and the children who had been by this time grown up. But the children were not happy over the conditions in the family because Newton had transformed his daughters into amanuenses. They had to take all of his verses and write them. He dictated to them morning, noon, and night for years, which was a little difficult upon young girls growing up. So it's understandable that they did not entirely appreciate the extreme severity of their father. Any question, any doubt, any uncertainty met a great, tremendous anger from John. He did not believe that anything could take the place or equal in importance or should be permitted to interfere with a labor dedicated to the glory of God. So his... Uh, children became absolutely important to him, necessary to him. But he continued to uh, feel that behind everything that he did was a pressure uh, that was more than earthly. He used the medium of poetry in the presentation of his work, which was, of course, also the popular medium of nearly all of the early literary lights of the 17th century. He uh, was on, in the same group of the, as the earlier Greek poets. There was something about his work that showed that he was well-versed in the Odyssey and Iliad of Homer. He was also well-equipped in the study of Hesiod. He was like many of the later men, like Dryden, who made a poetic translation of the Aeneas and uh, uh, Virgil, and, of course, Dante, whose divine comedy was given in verse. The great epics of that time were nearly always in poetic form. There was a tremendous vocabulary involved in this procedure. And it is amazing that any person unable to see would be able to continue to call upon the internal resources of his mind sufficiently to be able to dictate these very complicated expressions with the most involved use of unusual English terms. In any event, however, the work was a success from the standpoint of the original intent. As a reward for his labor of months and years in the preparation of Paradise Lost, uh, Milton was rewarded financially by a publisher who gave him about 20 pounds for the entire work. In other words, Milton didn't care. He wasn't interested in money. This is one very strong point in his favor. He made practically nothing out of any of his versifications. But that pleased him all right. He was not at all embittered by it. But the Paradise Lost became so popular that between the years 1700 and 1800, there were over a hundred editions. At the same time, there were only a dozen editions of Shakespeare. Now, in those days... Uh, Milton's poem had a very wide circulation because it touched into the religious life of the people very intimately. It was almost like reading the Bible.
and to many people Milton became another prophet. The Old Testament has to do, of course, with that part of the uh, life of our ancestors from the creation of the world to the flood of Noah. And this was the area upon which the uh, 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 Milton prepared and wrote his Paradise Lost. The second part was suggested to him by a friend, Paradise Regained. In this case, it was the New Testament that became his instrument, and he built the entire theme around the saving power of Christ. The second part of the poem, however, has never had as great an interest because it is shorter and because it lacks the tremendous dramatic impact of a subject such as the fall of the angels and things of this nature. Now, it also appears that uh, Milton had certain attitudes about life which were completely uh, related to the early Protestant movements in England. This had to do, the main one had to do, with the problem of original sin. There was a saying that was well, all over Massachusetts during the 17th century, a sort of something that school children had to remember. Namely, with Adam's fall, we sinned us all. And the problem of original sin became a very important factor in Milton's thinking. Not because it satisfied him entirely, but because it was the only approach that was at that time acceptable to 17th century religious thinking. The idea of evolution as we know it today was unknown. There was no way of trying to solve the great problem, which is summed up in the concept of, uh, perhaps put into the words of Buddha as well as anyone has ever said it, namely, if God cannot prevent evil, he is not God. And if he can prevent it and does not prevent it, he is not good. Therefore, the problem was to solve this dilemma. And this became the basic background of Milton's theology, was to try to determine and understand the problem of original sin. Now, of course, this has plagued the church from the beginning. It has plagued practically all thinkers who have been idealists. The only people who are not worried about it are the materialists. They do not care. But there has to be, to the idealist, to the religionist, to the individual, the spiritual ideals and overtones, there has to be an explanation of the fall of man. Now, this constitutes a, a very large and spectacular and complex factor. And Milton, of course, approached it in the terms of his own day. But in so doing, he has also left to us a number of speculations uh, which were inserted uh, with certain variations upon the biblical theme. And in the, in the study of these specializations, we get a glimpse of something else about Milton's philosophy that perhaps has considerable current value for us today. According to... Milton, this perverseness in human nature, which resulted in the fall of man, was the direct result of the interference of Satan in the descent of the human family. Milton, however, seems to sense something else also. He seems to represent or figure that this perverseness in human nature is in some way inherent not necessarily because of the sins of our remote progenitors, but because of certain continuing complications in our own natures. In other words, the individual, most individuals throughout time that we have record of, have fought a struggle within themselves in order to achieve some form of integrities each individual has had to overcome himself in one way or another. His self is composed of a compound of spiritual values and material pressures. The individual would do right, but evil is ever nigh unto him. Now, Milton accepts the general theory that this evil originates in the beginning of the race, 
But uh, if he uh, broadens his foundations, then Adam and Eve become symbolical of a collective humanity. That in some mysterious way, the individual was given what uh, uh, Aquinas calls a restricted or limited individualism. He has the power of personal choice. Now, this is important for one very significant reason. If man has no choice, then he can have no virtue. Because virtue must be a decision. And if there is no possibility of a decision, then there can be no uh, even limited individualism. Many of the mystics have assumed that this is the problem that separates man from the angels. The angelic host, not having any power of restricted or limited individualism, obey inevitably the law of heaven. But man has to choose to obey. Now this choice of obedience is in some way essential to his growth and development. Perhaps we can bring it down to the simple level of family life today. Children growing up are under the protection of parents, but all children at a certain time break away from parental influence. In the greater way of the, of the Bible, this breaking away from parental guidance more or less represents the fall. The individual becomes responsible for himself. He must make his own decisions. He must choose his own integrities. He must de dedicate his life to the unfoldment of his own resources. In this particular level of things, we find that the human being has what we call the power of choice. No creature has free will. Free will probably is not even available to deity. But free will is a thought that many people misunderstand. Free will would mean that you could do anything that you wanted to do. But uh, limited and more by circumstances, man has a power of choice. There are many things that he can't do and he doesn't even expect to. There are many decisions that he can't make. He cannot do what he pleases. He can only do what he can do. Therefore, he has usually a series of choices. He can stay in the present job or get another one. He can marry the girl or not. He can decide on a, being, a, being a lawyer or he can decide on being an architect. He can do all these things, but outside of a certain area, he cannot have free will. Now, the fact that he has not free will has a certain benefit. He is no longer dominated by an arbitrary uh, code against which he can offer no resistance. He is now a free agent. He is now permitted to make his own decisions. And he is given the privilege of being right. This is the very important point in the whole thing. And uh, this is brought out in Paradise Lost. When the time comes for Adam and Eve to be sent away from the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden would represent childhood. It would represent uh, a parental control. And even in modern par parenthood, many parents keep on saying, Thou shalt not. You're not, you're not going to do this because I'm not going to let you. And the child remains comparatively docile for a while, but remembers these things. And the first time it gets a chance to do exactly as it pleases, it does so. Now, in the case of uh, Adam and Eve in the, in the allegory, uh, they are sent out into a world in which they have the right to bear, to bear their own integrities. They must face life. In other words, in a strange way, the, when they are cast out of Eden, it means that they have reached the age of adulthood, that they have reached a voting age that they reach the age when they can be conscripted into the army if necessary, and they have the right to be considered adult. Now this means that suddenly they are individuals. Now why is this important? Why would heaven want this?
rather than to keep them forever uh, as very pleasant children in, uh, under a complete domination of their elders. Well, in a sense, this is answered by the allegory or fable or parable of the prodigal son. The prodigal son is the one who goes out and gets into trouble. But when he understands and realizes his mistakes, he comes back, and for him the fatted calf is served on a very nice dinner. But the son or brother who stayed home is not so honored. The honor goes to the one who made a mistake, found it out, and corrected it. This makes, it begins the study of integrities. So apparently the reason why the individual is forced upon his own resources is because his compound nature, uh, which he has gradually evolved from thousands and millions of years, has brought him into a complex situation within himself. He is composed now of a moral nature, and an ambition. He is a, a pessimist and an optimist. He is healthy and he is sick. He is successful and he is unsuccessful. All of these things are due primarily to his own equipment, to the subjective forces of his own life. Gradually, apparently, it is important that man shall become greater than the angels. And this is only possible by virtue. In childhood he is innocent. In adulthood he must be virtuous. And the long years, lives, embodiments of growth through the many incarnations transforms primordial innocence into ultimate maturity. Now this probably represents the wisdom of the guiding power that is far greater than we realize. We no longer need to think of deity as either unable to control evil or unwilling to. It is no longer this at all. It is the problem of a conscientious parent determined to lead its child to maturity, to make the child a complete person, to make the child capable of becoming the foundation of a future so that humanity can establish a dynasty of growth and progress, which will go on until ultimate perfection is attained. In order that this could be possible, the human being has to stand on his own feet. And this is where most people today are still in trouble. Theology has not sufficiently required that religion must be a demand for maturity. Religion must be not merely a consolation of weakness, but an inspiration of strength. And until it is so recognized, the theologies are in trouble. Because if the religion is not joining something. It is becoming something. It may be that you join or you do not join. This is not the critical point. The critical point is that joining or not joining, the individual must develop, unfold, and mature his own resources. He must become a mature human being. The process by which he accomplishes this is one aspect of evolution. For evolution is not only the growth of forms through nature, it is the unfoldment of potentials from within the individual. Many mystics of ancient times were quite convinced that the spirit of negation in man is the demon, and that the fall of man is a fall of the human being away from his own integrities through inexperience or immaturity. Every individual makes mistakes. Every mistake is a fall. Most people who are thoughtful learn something from their mistakes, and this is an ascent so that there is a constant conflict going on because no matter what we learn, we never seem to know enough. We never seem to be able uh, to meet the future with full maturity of insight and understanding. In order to understand this, we also have to realize the temptation. For the temptation scene is one of the most uh, delightful of all, of incidentally, of all of these theologians, Milton gives us something. Milton excuses the snake, which is a very big thing. 
He doesn't forgive the snake, but he excuses it because he says that the snake was deceived in his own case, that the evil one came and deceived first the snake, and the snake perfectly innocently carried on the mistake. So this is one point where he has a, a certain variation from the traditional form. But actually, uh, the uh, temptation problem has to do with the multitude of factors that are involved in the complex evolution of the human being. Here, Milton's Paradise Regained summarizes the matter very neatly, because through the Christian mystery, as represented in the life of the Savior and his, uh, the writings of the New Testament, the individual is restored to his spiritual heritage. But the temptation now is something that is forever. The temptation today is abroad in the land in the many ways. Young people are tempted to narcotics, alcoholism, and crime. Older people are tempted to avarice, uh, to various deceits, ranging from minor misrepresentations to bank robbery. Uh, crimes of violence arise on every hand. These are the result of the individual being unable to withstand the pressures of his own desires, his own appetites, his own false values. Because he wishes to be a member of a peer group that is delinquent itself, he falls into delinquency. He tries to be uh, competitive to the fashions of his time. He wants to be richer than the others. He wants to have more power than the others. He wants to be handsomer than the others. All of these pressures arise from false values inside himself. Now, the reason why he has these false values is because he hasn't been adequately trained by parents who had exactly the same false values, but perhaps were a little more conservative with them. Here, an interesting angle comes into the story of uh, Milton's Paradise Lost. When the uh, deity observes that Satan is wandering around on the borders of the Edenic Garden, he feels that Adam and Eve should receive some special schooling in this matter. In other words, he did not wish to leave them hopelessly uh, to the mercy of Satan. So the Lord in his wisdom sends down the archangel Raphael. And it is said in the Zohar and in the Talmud and in the Kabbalah, that, that Adam and Eve attended the school of the angels. Particularly, they were taught by Raphael. They were taught by him the problem of the war in heaven, the problem of, of the deceits and so forth that had been brought into the world, the reason why sin and death had come, and all of these things, and they were warned by Raphael not to succumb to the temptation. And this was a word of why, uh, wisdom. This was the advice of the guardian. Now, we can take Raphael and we can magnify him a million times, and we can say that Raphael becomes a personification of all the great idealistic religions and philosophies of the world. They are available to everyone. Great integrities have been honored in our human culture. Great teachers have our respect, Buddha and Christ, Muhammad, Zoroaster. All of these great teachers have the admiration of mankind. They have given the instructions to those whose immortal futures were endangered by selfishness, ignorance, and fear. But in most cases, these teachers have been honored, but their teachings have not been obeyed. For the most part... The individual believes that in some way his salvation merely comes from the acceptance that there is a better way of life, but is not impelled by an effort to cultivate that better way of life in personal conduct. So the teachings of Raphael and Eden run against the same problem as the temptations that meet us every day in our lives here. And when someone comes along in the form of the traditional snake or the source of the snake and whispers to us that we can get away with something, we are only too delighted to try it. We want to do as we please. 
We want knowledge. We want to eat of the tree of knowledge. Uh, but we do not want to be penalized for the abuse of that knowledge. We want to know the multiplication table, but we don't want to be allowed to use it to foreclose on the widows and the fatherless and the find common debt. But the individual gaining, the, gaining knowledge gains the greatest responsibility that is conceivable. And knowledge without integrity is one of the most horrible hazards the world faces. Skill without mind, without heart, without conviction can destroy civilization. So uh, Milton is trying to tell us in a current form of verses uh, that man was not able uh, to support the instruction that was given to him by the archangel Raphael. Raphael, of course, does constitute the eyewitness, the mystic. And, and according to the medieval, medieval and early modern mystics such as Hildegard and uh, Bamey, the archangels testimonies are part of a great message from heaven. This same type of message is reported in the writings of Baron Emanuel Swedenborg. They were uh, lessons from paradise, uh, instructions, uh, inspirations, but very few human beings have been able to really combat the negative influence in themselves. And uh, the, the temptation is that if you have the knowledge, then your use or abuse of it determines your fate. Now today we are in this position where many of these points should be very obvious to us. We should realize that science has given us a tremendous amount of knowledge. It has also threatened our survival. We know that political sciences have given us great rules of government from the Code of Hammurabi and the Code of Justinian and the Mosaic Code and the Code of Napoleon. They've all been great legal codes which we have cheerfully broken. And the Mosaic Code and the Code of Napoleon. They've all been great legal codes which we have cheerfully broken. We find that in every profession the search for profit has re resulted in the corruption of ethics. We realize everywhere that man has not been able to withstand the glamour of temptation. Temptation seems to be something that makes, you, makes it possible for you to do as you please. Another interesting point is man's oversight. In fact, he's probably a lot blinder than Milton was in the, in the method, ethical and moral sense because man has become oblivious to the obvious consequences of his own conduct. We have had our Alexander, who died outside the walls of Babylon, from dissipation. But dissipation co goes on, and nobody seems to have done anything about it. We have the, um, the conquest of, uh, of Hitler. We have the conquest of Genghis Khan. Always tragedy, murder, and death. But conquest still goes on. We have all the private problems that were criticized and condemned 5,000 years ago, but we haven't gotten over them. The Code of Hammurabi, King of Babylon, supposedly dictated by Nebo, the Lord of the Writing Table, said if a man builds a house and he doesn't build it properly and it collapses, the builder is responsible and must replace it. There'd be a lot of people out of work if we made that stick. <laughs> that any individual who makes a product, representing it to be something, and it is not what it is represented to be, has committed a crime against society and a sin against God. And get out and clean it up. Well, they tried it 2,000, 3,000 years ago. We know definitely that the many of the ancient Egyptians had codes. And that among other codes, well, there's one in Egypt in the Book of the Dead that is well worth remembering. In that particular work, uh, gossip is listed among the major sins that can keep the individual out of heaven. You know, it would be an awful hard time around here if we ever enforced that one. <laughs> Many people would be speechless. <laughs> the... Uh, but the ancients had some good ideas, but we've done nothing with them. 
We have also found from antiquity the principles of government. Lycurgus knew the rules of government. Thales knew the rules of government. And they applied them in their own time. And they succeeded as long as they were able to control the ambition of individuals. So everywhere we find not necessarily a, a slithery snake somewhere. We find rather a constant little pressure inside of ourselves saying to us all the time, you can get away with that if you want to. So we get away with all kinds of things and completely forget when we look around us that no one is getting away with anything. This is the thing we haven't realized. Milton makes a great point of that. After the uh, fall, a man is placed in a new world that God created for him. God did not want him to perish. He was no longer able to stay in paradise because he was no longer the innocent child. But he should have a good place to live, a proper place. So they created, God created in his wisdom, the earth. And this was to be the world in which man was to work out his destiny and redeem himself. Here he was to have everything that was necessary, but he had to work. Here he had every opportunity to build a beautiful world, but he had to decide to do it. So uh, the Lord, instead of tending him into perdition, gave him a planet to work on. Gave him a very beautiful planet, uh, which was so lovely, so, so pleasant, so uh, overshadowed by divine right, that it offended Satan to the marrow of, his, marrow of his bones. Satan decided he had to get control of that planet. And to get that control, he got all his legions together, and he invaded the planet and took it over. And that which had been intended to be a very wonderful place uh, was suddenly uh, beset with all the sins, crimes, and delinquencies of the fallen angels. Now, here we have another very interesting problem to consider. The, the angels that fell were rebels against deity. And they become a symbol of rebels against truth. They become emblematic of the, of the pressures of an anti-Christ power. They are selfishness, superstition, and fear. And through them, sin, guilt, and death came into the world, according to Milton. These were not part of the original plan, but they were necessary when that plan was broken, because they became the penalties of the errors that man was committing. In other words, no matter how hard he tried, how rich he became, death stood to take it away from him until he learned how to so live that his values were incorruptible. The New Testament, carrying on into the uh, paradise regained, is the problem of man storing up his treasures in heaven rather than depending upon the banks and the stock exchange. Well, many people have been wiped out in the stock exchange. But no one has been destroyed because he possessed a treasure of internal virtues. And I remember one day when I was down on Wall Street, one of my slumming expeditions, <laughs> when I was starting out in life, a man walked out of the stock exchange on Wall Street and 50 feet away from me shot, his, shot himself to death. This was not due to heaven. This was not due to a vengeance of God. It was due to the fact that the individual had so adversely conditioned his own temperament, his own disposition, that he could not survive the loss of a material gain. It was taken from him. He had nothing left to live for. In 29, when they had the bad times, one man told me, he said, I lost all I had, but it, it was worth it because I had the first good night's sleep that I ever had. There was nothing more to go, so I could rest. So all these things add up to the mysterious forces which are personified in the biblical stories. These forces represent the unfoldment of man's own potential. 
So we find Milton explaining in, in these terms how man has to take over and wrest from powers of evil the control of his own planet. We probably were never as aware of this difficulty as we are right now. We suddenly realize, whether we like it or not, that we are custodians of a planet in trouble. That it is no longer possible to simply say the other fellow has to do something about it. There is no longer no area where we can go and explore and establish a primitive way of life again. We cannot escape the pressures that are closing in on every hand. These pressures are not inevitable. These pressures are not the vengeance of deity. These pressures are our own mistakes coming home to roost, and we're going to have to do something about them. And this is exactly what was the idea, as Milton tells us, of the new world that was created for Adam and Eve after they left or lost their par paradisical home. They lost the complete uh, uh, purity of life. They lost the complete uh, acceptance of the divine will. They were children. And then all of a sudden they weren't children anymore. And they suddenly faced themselves. And they made themselves girdles of fig leaves to conceal or cover themselves. And these represent to a certain degree the vast bo body of cultures, traditions, social mores, and everything you can think of. Everything that you can think of in a form to cover the emptiness of the inner self, to disguise the poverty of the self by concealing it beneath the luxury-stricken uh, outer personality. In other words, we, we began to cultivate the habit of the famous uh, house paint slogan, save the surface and you save all. So we've been trying to save the surface ever since. And we're spending billions of dollars every year dressing up the surface. We're doing everything you can think of to look our best. In most cases, do our worst at the same time. So we are finding that the effort to conceal our own weaknesses doesn't work very well. Instead of producing a kind of a bluffed culture that would uh, fool ourselves and maybe a few other people, we find the whole thing falling apart. And the only answer to this collapse is the realization that the solution lies within ourselves. For into the human being's compound is not only added the physical sources of energy and so forth, but within that same compound is the inevitable and eternal presence of deity. Within mankind, there is life simply because there is a divine power in man. The divine power is still there, always has been and always will be. When that power departs, death follows. So we have within ourselves at all times the potential of self-correction. It is possible for us to change our ways because within our nature is a higher way which we'll have a long time before we can catch up with entirely. But there is within us the potential of infinite good. This potential has to be cultivated. Milton found out in his day that this was the weakness in the educational system. Education was not looking for that union with the divine, which is the secret of human security. Education was not teaching the individual to be true to the divine birthright, which was his natural heritage. Education dealt with secondary matters and tertiary matters. It dealt with making a living or gaining a reputation or having office in public or something of this nature, or perhaps, worst of all, settling down for life on the campus. It was not solutional to things. It did not teach the individual the mystery of his own destiny. Yet that mystery was unfolded to Adam and Eve by Raphael while they were still in the garden. In other words, the intuitive faculty was still there. Man knows if he goes deeply enough into himself the answer to his own problem. But he doesn't want to explore that area too thoroughly. Because if he finds out what he should do, 
He may not be able to do what he should not do with a good spirit. He might feel reformed rising within him, which would be most discomforting. The individual still wants to do exactly as he pleases. And this willfulness, according to the Zohar, for this fell the angels. Self-will, as opposed to divine will, is the mystery of good and evil. Self-will represents a small fragment within each of us that never yet has won any major problem or defeated any major evil. Self-will is the willingness to depend entirely upon the gratification of personal desires. The uh, mystics of all nations, the Hindus, the Chinese, and even the Greeks and Latins, realized that self-will was a tremendous force. That self-will can and does, in most instances, completely control the individual. And furthermore, the collective self-will controls the world. Therefore, the only problem that we have to really consider is how to re-educate the self-will. How to bring the self-will into harmony with the divine will. So that we can say honestly, not our will, but thine be done. This development of the inner will to achieve the release from evil is part of the theology of many of the early uh, church fathers and perhaps especially it was present in the writings of uh, Ambrose and uh, several of the, of the well-known saints. But this self-will with us is the, merely the strength of gratification. Self-will sustains us while we make a mistake. It makes, we does it because we are basing our entire way of life upon externals. The individual is much more concerned with his adjustment to the outer world than he is with his adjustment to the inner life. And yet without adjustment to the inner life, not only his own outer world, but everyone else's will fall apart. The individual cannot survive if he compromises with principles. He thinks he can, but not only in this life, but in the great pattern of things. Integrity is the only asset that is permanently acceptable in nature. So, uh, not having listened to the voice of Raphael in the garden, Adam and Eve started out into a world in which they propagated and propitiated uh, the powers of self-interest. They suddenly knew themselves as beings, but they did not know the power that was locked within them. They realized they were punished. We are all punished. But they hated to accept the fact that they were the responsible source of their own trouble. So all the way down through to the time of Noah, uh, the problem of the multiplying and replenishing the earth uh, was hampered and destroyed by the absolute abandon to gratification or to the fulfillment of personal desires. And this pre-Noah world represents, in a sense, perhaps a young people graduating from school now on their own, and desires and determining to do as they please. And in most instances, there is a great disillusionment ahead. The individual has now power, but not principle. He can do these things, but he doesn't know why he shouldn't. He can take a beautiful and perfect situation and mutilate it without accepting responsibility. He can lie, but if it lie, this lie accomplishes something for his personal benefit at the moment, he feels personally justified. And this situation has also now more or less gotten down into the religious life of the person. Religion that was once a bulwark of integrities is now badly compromised. And today, religion has also 
felt the depression of, de of, of lack of integrities. So uh, finally Noah came along, the only one just in his generation, and uh, the world uh, was inundated by a flood. Now in the book, in the Bible, if you go back to the original Hebrew, the word deluge does not mean water. The deluge means an oblivion, a tremendous descent of futility upon the earth. It was more, we might say, the complete loss of the integrities, the virtues, the principles. It was chaos rather than water. And uh, over this, this devilish situation, Noah and his family were preserved. This uh, situation also uh, can be made contemporary at any time, because in the experiences of humanity, the clock as we know it is not the determinant. Events determine their own consequences. Timing is by means of the relationship of situations that arise. Night is when darkness controls the soul. Day is when light controls the soul. All the different time periods, cycles and so forth, tie into moods and attitudes of human beings in the various stages of their unfoldment and development. Disillusionment is the deluge, and it comes inevitably as the, in the course of human experience. The mistakes we make finally come down upon us in a heap of trouble. And we find the alcoholic, who is a moderate drinker, he gets along fairly well. He has been forced out of the Garden of Eden because his integrities are not very good. But he can still make a living and he can still plant a field and fulfill the admonition to go forth and replenish the earth. But as long as he goes on with this alcoholism or this delinquency that he may have, it slowly takes hold of him. And instead of being a moderate drinker, he gradually becomes an alcoholic. And the moment he has, is an alcoholic, then the deluge has come. The great darkness has descended upon him. And in many instances, he doesn't even want to recover. And he goes down in utter futility into a situation that has gradually built up. And the first centuries of humanity in the Bible, after the uh, loss of the Garden of Eden, can be likened to the problem of the individual who starts out on a career of compromise, trying to achieve worldly applause and, ex and ignoring the needs of his own nature. Now, one say, well, after all, he, wasn't, he had no way of knowing better. Uh, his parents couldn't tell him. Society doesn't tell him. Uh, how is he going to find out in time not to make these mistakes? Well, education should provide him with one factor, experience. He should learn to observe the consequences of the action of the law of cause and effect. There is no person in trouble who hasn't had a warning of some kind. If the individual uh, becomes a narcotic uh, trafficker, a young person, he's arrested, perhaps he's fined, perhaps he's disciplined, perhaps he's given six months in jail as a first offender. Now, if he's a first offender, well, he was also, that was his last offense, he would have learned his lesson. But it isn't. He comes out and repeats. Now, it's the same way with most of the problems of life. The individual making a compromise with principles has a tendency to drift along and get deeper and deeper into trouble until finally he is part of that world which has to be destroyed by a deluge. Now, the deluge doesn't mean that everyone dies. The deluge doesn't mean that water or air or anything else must fall from the sky. It means that the individual is drowned in his own mistakes, and a civilization lacking that, always working on that basis, is drowned in its own mistakes. Now, at the present time, a lot of people think we're down the first time at the moment, but we haven't gone down for the second and third time as yet. But now, when you go down for the first time, there's a superstitious belief that your life goes in panorama before your eyes, and you can still be rescued. <laughs> 
there is always a chance to rescue if the individual or the collective learns a lesson. If an experience means something, then there is always the possibility of further help. But if the individual passing through these emergencies learns nothing, refuses to accept the consequences of conduct, refuses to change his ways, then he continues until he is dissolved in the flood of his own mistakes. And this is a becoming an increasingly common condition. Now, religion has its place in this problem also, for gradually we have lost the realization that religion is a cooperative enterprise. The purpose of religion is to help all human beings to an, in, to an inner reconciliation of their lives with the principles of truth. But today, too many religions are simply battling each other. The competitive spirit has come in and competition of all kinds belongs to the world of errors. Competition is the thing that causes the individual to compromise his principles in order to secure an advantage. And various religions constantly berating each other, calling each other heathens, and demanding a complete allegiance to a creed rather than to a truth. All this is just part of that conspiracy by which the principle of evil is constantly at work in our lives. So everywhere we turn, we find that Milton has certain grounds for his assumption that Satan and his angels have taken over. But he promptly tells us it isn't essentially necessary, it isn't inevitable. So in the second part, uh, have, uh, Paradise Regained, uh, uh, Milton emphasizes the Christ ministry. He emphasizes the fact that even when the powers of evil were plotting to destroy the Garden of Eden, uh, the Messiah was present with, the, with his father, and that the Messiah promised to his father that he would intercede for the salvation of mankind. So his paradise regained is the story of the intercession. It is the story of the rise of the, a great example of integrities, a great principle of virtue, not as complicated nor as dramatic as the Old Testament, but working definitely upon the principle of love and honor. So that whereas man today considers love as merely a physical emotion. In the New Testament and in the concept of Christ, love is the saving grace of that which is so fond of something superior to itself that it will sacrifice the lesser for the greater. Love is therefore the sacrifice of, se of self-will in order to express dedication to the labors of divine will. It was through hate and conspiracy that the angels fell. It is through love and fraternity that man rises again, and in the course of it also saves the angels. Because it is only through man's own intercession that that which would fell of its own corruption can be saved. But man himself has within him always and forever the power to achieve the integrities that are necessary. So into the compound of human ambition, which was largely dominated by the satanic uh, impulse to corruption, there emerges the symbol of purity, the symbol of dedication, the symbol of an integrity which cannot be corrupted. And in this we find uh, the changes that are necessary in the life of the individual. Most people today, if they do not like something, they waste a great deal of energy hating it. And at the end of that time, they are gone and the problem is still there. Therefore, hatred solves nothing. The individual, uh, there's a story in one of the old uh, lives of the saints, one of the uh, ancient books that had to do like the golden legend. Uh, 
of a monk in his cell. And he was meditating and he was praying for help and guidance and trying to fight the evils that were within his own nature. And there was the cloud of smoke and the devil came up through the floor. And the devil, uh, the priest looked, the old monk looked at the devil and was very much startled and surprised. But instinctively, without realizing it, he blessed the devil. Instantly it changed into an angel. So this is something that uh, has a certain moral value to almost everyone. It deals with the idea that one of the ways of making good out of things that are wrong is to try desperately uh, to help rather than to criticize. To try and see good as far as possible is to strengthen good. To take a, an incident which is unpleasant and make it a lesson is to transmute base substances into gold. Alchemy is the transformation of the negative aspects of human experience. It is the things that have happened to us used to perfect our own lives. So in the alchemy, the transmutation of base substances means that all the physical experiences of life must be interpreted in terms of their spiritual values. Everything that happens must strengthen the inner life, either directly through inspiration and encouragement or indirectly through experience and resolution. Always the human being must use only the highest possible means to correct the difficulties from which he suffers. If he pr tries to com correct a mistake by making another one, he is not advancing his cause. So in this problem, we find that the human being sitting here today, a long time away from Milton, the human being is faced with these, this whole great biblical uh, drama, a perpetual drama, a drama that is present in the rise and fall of nations that may well be involved in the formation and gradual disintegration of solar systems and universal systems. But a problem that also sits right on our own doorstep. That there has to be, in the in life of the individual, some way of changing the conduct which is destructive to himself and others. When we become involved in a religious organization, normally, uh, we like to believe that we are going to live a better life. We want to talk about baptism. And there are a great many people who think that the individual is in desperately bad shape if he isn't baptized. He's got to be baptized into something. But the Essenes gave another definition of baptism. They said that the real water of baptism is the sweat of honest labor. The Essenes labored to build homes for people. They made no charge for that work. They took wood and timbers and they gathered together. They built a little house for a newly married couple so that they would always have a home. And when they were finished, they left. No responsibility rested with the family. If it wished to be grateful, it could because nothing can prevent us from being grateful if we are so minded. But there is no problem that can be solved merely by being, as Voltaire said on, a, on occasion, hit over the back of the head with a douche of water. This will not do it. It is necessary for the individual to realize that baptism is dedication. It means absolutely nothing unless it leads to a conviction of responsibility for character. So uh, Milton got into trouble too because he had a rather difficult disposition. He wasn't by any means perfect. He was the last to believe that he was. But he was one of those men that worked like the devil in the name of the Lord and he did the best he could. And he did accomplish a great deal. But he was again limited by his time and this limits everyone. There are things we cannot do now that we may do 50 years from now. There are things we do now that we should have stopped doing 50 years ago or 50 centuries ago. But there are still changes that must come. 
new discoveries, new involvements, new realizations of values, new ex uh, experiences in all types of consciousness and in instinct and intuition. These things are coming. But at the moment, we should try our best to make a constructive foundation for tomorrow. We are passing on at the moment a disaster. We are passing on to the young and the unborn problems that should have been solved thousands of years ago. But we have completely misunderstood the purpose of life. Now Milton points out that we have made the mistake primarily because we have assumed uh, that death is an end. That we have assumed that we have no permanence, that we are only able to be here for a short time and from there on, we must face the eternal consequences of conduct, according to Christian theology. But what we really have to recognize is something very much more important than that. We have to realize, as Milton brings out also, that anything that can be destroyed by death, as we know it, cannot be regarded as essential to the unfoldment of man. Only that which transcends the grave is worth having while you're here. Instead of assuming that we could tra save up treasures in heaven and do as we please here, is to get into trouble. We carry into the afterworld that which we have accomplished. We become in another way what we are. We give up what we have and must depend totally upon the integrities that we have developed. So Milton is very essentially determined to point out that the individual is under the control of a situation which he fully knows. The human being knows that he has his years are numbered. Maybe a few more or a few less. less. But he knows the future of himself. He must leave behind everything that he has. Therefore, it is not reasonable or right that he should spend all his life accumulating the things he has to leave behind. That there must be a part of his life devoted to that which he can take with him. And the only thing he can take with him is himself. A, a, a redeemed or revitalized or regenerated inner life. He can take his dreams and his hopes and his aspirations, but he cannot take his worldly goods. And he does not know when the day comes between natural incidents, accidents, war, catastrophes, plagues, all these crimes, all these things. No one knows how long he's going to be here in this particular embodiment. Therefore, from the day he is old enough to think he must devote more and more of his attention to those things which permit him to depart in honor from this world when that time comes. Otherwise, the whole experience of life is lost. And it is the loss of this experience uh, that Milton decries mostly. He realizes in some way, just as he didn't like the way England was governed and he tried to do something about it, but unfortunately, the remedy was about as bad as the crime, and very little was accomplished. But he knew also that nations can never live together, that governments can never serve their purposes until they are motivated by integrity and fraternity and dedication. That they must be honorable. That they must not compromise their realities. And the same is true of every person. Each of us, in our own funny little way, is trying to live easily or trying to get away from certain difficulties, but we have to face into the emergencies of personal existence, because that is the way of paradise regained. The individual is here because he's imperfect. There's nobody here that's perfect. It has been said there was only one person in this world who has ever been perfect, and they killed him. So we are not perfect. We are not near it, but it is possible for us to come a little closer to the destiny for which we were intended.
The human being is not a body primarily, but a life in a body. And it is the release of this life, the glorious expression of the best part of ourselves, that constitutes growth and brings with it harmony, peace, and security. And because, actually, we are a temple, a building in which there is the presence of the divine, a, an altar in the human heart, in which we must come and face the truths of life, and that in this heart body we are all servants, that we are all here to see that the good in ourselves has a chance. We are here to honor that which is most honorable in ourselves, and in so doing, we will honor that which is most honorable in the world. And in a, well, it really would be worthwhile to read at least an abridgment or digest of Milton's poems, because they, they can be transformed into contemporary messages. The whole story tells what has happened to humanity within the knowledge of the living and which can be restored from the history of those who have gone before. The whole story of Paradise Lost is man compromising his own integrities for the justification and satisfaction of his ambitions and appetites. As long as this goes on, we're going to have the same thing. And until a better way of life is incorporated into our educational system, until it becomes a part of our governmental pattern, until it becomes the ethical foundation of our professions, until these changes take place, we will be victims of a system of human competition which has destroyed every civilization that is gone and is undermining rapidly those that are still here. And uh, to have uh, paradise regained is simply the human being has to put his world in order. If he does, there is peace, security, and all the necessities of life can be made available to those that need them. Ambition dies. There is enough of everything. While ambition lives, some will starve. It is then part of a plan and Milton's Paradise Lost is simply the story of what we did wrong and Paradise Regained, what we must do to re repair the mistakes that we have made. Well, I guess that's all, folks.